I'm sure you guys noticed by now the S&P 500 is on a historic rally. Only three negative months in the last 13 months. And aside from September 2023, the other two negative months were negligible at negative 1% and negative 2% for the month. Other than that, the stock market has been a straight rocket up. Now, why is that? Well, aside from the record number of cash sitting on the sidelines in 2023, a number of short squeezes, the fact that money managers had to put money to work towards the end of 2023, the fact that we were coming out of a bear market market and hit a 10% correction. It all really hinges on the most important driver of macroeconomic data right now, and that is the Fed. But last Friday, Jerome Powell conveniently talked when the market was closed for Good Friday and might already be signaling a complete change to what is expected from the Fed. And if you care about your money and your portfolio, I promise I'll make it worth your while. You definitely want to stick around. Let's get right into it. So last Friday, which was Good Friday, a market holiday, Jerome Powell spoke at the San Francisco Macroeconomics and Monetary Policy Conference in San Francisco. And and contrary to the last couple of official FOMC conferences, here's what Jerome Powell said about interest rate cuts and the fact that the Fed actually doesn't need to rush interest rate cuts. And there's a growing narrative now that the Fed might actually not cut for the entirety of 2024. And I happen to be in that camp as of now. Let's take a listen. I'll break it down for you, tell you what it means for your money and your portfolio. The economy is strong. We see very strong growth. We had growth for last year over 3%. Uh, many forecasters see growth coming down to around 2% this year. That, that's about what, roughly what the first quarter looks like. That means that we don't need to be in a hurry to cut. It means we can wait and, and become more confident that, in fact, inflation is coming down to 2% on a sustainable basis. My own expectation is I don't think rates will go back down to the very, very low levels they were at before the pandemic. But where they will turn out to settle out, it's hard to say. It, this, this economy doesn't feel like it's suffering um, from the current level of rates, although in if you look at things like uh, inflation-sensitive spending, then right. those parts of the economy are really feeling the high rates. So a couple of things to note there. You heard that Jerome Powell said that the economy is actually strong. And yes, if you take a look at traditional metrics such as the GDP, it shows that the U.S. economy is still growing. The last GDP report came out at a growth rate of 3.4%. But he also hinted at inflation-sensitive spending being high. And if you take a look at CPI, actually, let's take a look at the last seven CPIs. Only one time has the CPI come in under than expectations. We have one, two, three, four, five times out of the last seven times that CPI came in above expectations. And only once did we actually meet expectations. And if we take a look at core PCE, which is the Fed's preferred gauge, according to them, core PCE does look a little bit better than CPI. As a matter of fact, core PCE looks like most months is coming in line with expectations. However, when the Fed talks about 2% inflation, are they talking about core PCE or are they talking about CPI? Of course, they're talking about CPI. Now, what does all this mean for the raging stock market? Is this going to change things? Well, for that, we need to take a look at the Fed's dot plot real quick. What is a dot plot? It is just a fancy term for the expectations that the different FOMC members, the different Fed members, have for the federal funds rate. And the federal funds rate is just the rate that the Fed sets for banks to do business with each other. So when banks borrow money from each other and lend money to each other, the federal funds rate dictates the rate at which they do this. And this is why the federal funds rate affects the economy. The Fed is not a regulatory body. They can't force banks to change their interest rates. But if they raise their interest rate at which the bank borrows, then the banks have no choice but to increase their interest rates because they're getting charged at a higher rate now. Anyway, all that aside, if we take a look at what happened in the summer of 2023 when the Fed released its dot plot and also coincidentally instituted its last rate hike, most FOMC participants estimated that we would have at least five rate cuts in 2024. Now, because of that and continued messaging from Jerome Powell signaling that July was likely the last rate hike, the market continues to roar. And this is despite the fact that the last dot plot, which came out in March 2024, most FOMC participants only expect now three rate cuts for 2024, not five. And as economic data continues to come in hot and CPI continues to be as stubborn as it is, really there is no reality in which the Fed can cut soon. There is only one instance in which the Fed can cut and that is a black swan event. Now, before I give you my plays and how I'm investing considering this data, we do have to talk about what happens when the Fed cuts. There is a misconception that the market crashes every time the Fed cuts, and this is simply not true. As a matter of fact, the reason that the market is rallying is because when the Fed cuts, the market usually rallies, 
but only when there is no threat of recession. Let's take a look at the data. But if you take a look at the data from the early 80s to now, when the Fed cuts and there is no threat of recession, the market tends to rally and it tends to rally in a very healthy manner. However, in 2001, the S&P and the NASDAQ were severely negative after the rate cut. Same thing happened in 2007. And that is because in 2007, for example, things started already breaking. Not only did we have a major drop off in home sales, but we started getting a higher rate of mortgage defaults. The GDP tanked, unemployment shot through the roof at 5% and above, and inflation was still 3%. And if you take a look at 2001, GDP tanked as well from 4.1% to 1%. Unemployment went from 3.9% to 5.7% and inflation was also hovering around 3%. All that is to say that the Fed does not cut early, especially when they are fighting inflation. The last time they did that was the early 80s. They learned from their lesson, and Paul Volcker had to raise rates to 20% in order to fight returning inflation. Jerome Powell is not going to make that same mistake. So what does this all mean for the markets and for your portfolio? Well, Jerome Powell simply is signaling that the Fed is not going to cut rates. He conveniently stated that on Good Friday when the market was closed. The Fed's dot plot is already showing much fewer rate cuts. If you take a look at historical recessionary markers, such as the inverted yield curves, these are very far from an inverting, which typically needs to happen before a recession is declared. Now, we know that the Fed has never achieved a soft landing when fighting inflation. And since the early 80s, the Fed also has never cut rates prematurely. And I do think that the stock market can continue rallying most likely until recessionary markers start popping up, until things start breaking in the economy, and until the economy forces the Fed to cut. The Fed is not going to cut beforehand. Now, albeit, I do think we will have pullbacks and corrections along the way. And in terms of how I'm investing, you guys know my investing style. I'm always looking for asymmetrical bets. I'm not looking to buy the highs here. Now, what is an asymmetrical bet? It is simply when the gains far outweigh the risks taken. I made videos recently about what stocks and indexes I do like here at these prices. And since I mentioned the Russell 2000 back in November, the Russell 2000 has been up 23% and still has about 15 to 16% left to hit its all-time highs. And I did a full video on the Russell 2000, but when there is this kind of disparity between the small caps and the large caps, very similar to what we saw in early 2000s. The Russell 2000 tends to outperform the S&P 500 for years well into the recession if a recession happens. The next thing that I really like here is Tesla. I've done videos about this before. I'm about to do an updated video on my Tesla investment thesis, but they just released a new beta of FSD. And like I said, I will be doing a follow up video breaking down their numbers. Now Tesla is about to report its Q1 numbers and Q1 for Tesla is generally its worst delivery quarter. So if Tesla underperforms in Q1 and we get a pullback, I will definitely be dollar cost averaging into Tesla, especially if it gets to prices lower than what it has seen recently. Now, the top of my list for asymmetrical bets was Google. And if you take a look at my alert, I alerted Google as a buy on March 7th. The reason I alerted it is because it had tanked due to PR pressure. Now, I love when I see mega cap companies that have a healthy amount of cash flows that are still growing, especially if they are trillion dollar companies. I love when there is a PR nightmare and the company suffers a large drop in the short term. This creates an asymmetrical bet. So the whole story with Google's woke AI, as if Google is not going to put in place measures very quickly to change the perception of their AI based on what news is reporting. For Google, remedying this is like flipping a switch. It's not something that is effort intensive from the engineering side. Is the little interim mistake that Google made on the AI side really worth 15% of the company? And the answer is, of course not. It was an overreaction and I was happy to buy it. And I made more from that Google investment in a couple of weeks than the average gain of the S&P 500 on a yearly basis. We made around 13% on that buy. And I personally am not buying more Google here. I'm just stating the fact that asymmetrical bets is what you want to go for. Now, the other thing that I'm bullish on leading up to the halving is Bitcoin. However, I do own a lot of Bitcoin, but I'm looking at the Bitcoin miners because the Bitcoin miners right now are decorrelated with Bitcoin. Now, if you take a look at the correlation coefficient, this is something that doesn't happen often, but when it happens, you want to take advantage of it, especially if there's an expectation that Bitcoin is going to surge in pricing. And I think within the next year, 
after the having Bitcoin will cross the six figure mark. So those are some of the types of investments that I'm looking at considering where we are in this landscape. I'm not excited buying QQQ at all time highs. I'm not ex excited buying SPY at all time highs. And if you want the full range of what I'm buying, including my day trading alerts, we day trade futures every single day. We swing trade options, we sell options as well. And then we also do long-term stock analysis. If you're interested in the full gamut of my plays, make sure you check out the link in the description. Use the coupon code below. Do not sign up without that coupon code. That'll get you access for $99 a month for life. And if you want to work with me personally, make sure you apply using the link below. Please don't waste my time as I won't waste yours. And there you have it. Leave it in the comment section below. Let me know if you think that Jerome Powell and the Fed are going to cut this year. Do you think they're going to hold off for 2025? Do you think there will be more cuts this year? Do you think a recession is coming this year? In what area do you think the Black Swan event will be? I happen to be uh, pretty concerned about commercial real estate at these rates, but I'm always curious to hear your guys' thoughts. If you got anything out of this video, leave it a big fat thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel. Hit that notification bell. Stay safe out there, traders. Peace.